A few months ago, I saw this video by Mr. V where he crowned Fernando Alonso as the highest rated F1 driver of all time using the Chess ELO rating system. I was really happy with this result at the time, but I thought there was something missing. Because in F1, a driver's performance isn't just about their skill, it's hugely dependent on the car. But as Mr. V pointed out, comparing the drivers directly often means you're just rating the cars. So his solution was to compare teammates, which works really well, but it has its limits. For example, what if a driver in a bad car wins against others who are in good cars? Their true skill might not be fully recognized. So how do we solve this problem? Well, we can just compare each driver and first rate the cars. With this approach, we can then accurately calculate each driver's rating while taking into account the performance of their car during that race. In order to do this accurately, let's first understand how the ELO rating system works. Imagine each driver has a score, a rating that changes based on their race outcomes. Before any matchup, the ELO system predicts the outcome using this formula. Let's say drivers A and B are going head to head. Each has their own current rating, RA for driver A and RB for driver B. The system calculates expected scores EA and EB predicting how likely it is for each driver to win. Now the race happens, and if driver A wins, their score goes up. If they lose, it goes down. The amount is determined by something called the K-factor, and this is really the most important aspect of the entire ELO rating system. We can think of K as the sensitivity of the system. A high K-factor means a single race can hugely impact a driver's rating, while a low K factor rewards consistency and drivers who perform well over many races. Before we start coding the ELO engine, in order to make sure that the results are actually reliable, we need to lay down some key ground rules. First off, the core formula for the ELO rating system must stay untouched, because tampering with the math would defeat the whole purpose of having a standardized and reliable rating system. Secondly, in a game of chess, the entire game is the event. So in Formula 1, we have to consider the entire race from start to finish our event. This means we can't just update a driver or a team's rating mid-race. All changes in ELO ratings are tallied up and only applied once the race is over, ensuring every change in the rating of a driver is accounted for in one go. Keep in mind that in this case, I'm also taking into account the qualifying results, because that to a certain extent does measure a driver's skills. But I have lowered the k-factor for that, so it's not going to affect the rating as much as the race itself. Because at the end of the day, the most important number is the one next to the driver's name when they cross that checkered flag. No one really cares if you come first in qualifying and then last in the race. As for the last rule, and this is where things get a little tricky, we need to make sure that we're actually rating the drivers and not their cars. So the ELO rating formula for each driver must factor in the performance of their team in that specific race. This is where the main problem lies, because by doing this, we end up breaking our first rule and create a need to change the formula. So we're faced with a challenge. Stick to the original ELO principles while adapting it to the world of Formula 1. But there's something about the ELO rating system that hasn't been mentioned yet, and that's the variability of the K-factor. In chess, FIDE introduces a dynamic element to the K-factor that depends on several other factors like a player's highest rating, their number of games, or even their age. This variability allows for more drastic changes in the ratings when needed. For example, new and younger players will gain or lose rating very quickly, but experienced players will gain and lose rating much slower. So, to apply this to Formula 1, where cars heavily influence a driver's performance, we simply adapt the K-factor based on the cars each driver is racing. By taking the ratio of the ratings of two cars involved and tweaking our K-factor accordingly, we ensure our system reflects the true impact of cars without altering the core ELO formula. With this, the rules are clear. All we need to do now is write the code. And there we have it. Our ELO engine is ready. But before we get into the results, there's a crucial piece of context that we need to grasp about the world of Formula 1. As we already know, there's a limited number of races that happen each year. In the case of 2023, there were only 22 races. On chess.com, a person could probably play 22 games in one sitting. 
So the time scales involved here are very different and we need to adjust our K factor accordingly. For the constructors, I've taken the K factor as 64 during races and 16 during the qualifying. For the drivers, I've taken 32 during the races and eight during the qualifying. The reason I've taken a higher K factor for the constructors is because there's a higher likelihood of a constructor becoming bad all of a sudden in a new season. But with a driver, it's usually a gradual decrease. So the sensitivity needs to be a lot lower. I've also taken a page from Fide's book and added a rookie factor for the drivers. If a driver has less than 30 races, then it essentially doubles their K factor. So 64 for races and 16 for qualifying. One last thing to keep in mind is that the database is only updated up to the 2023 Belgian Grand Prix. I've also added the rest of the races from that season, but it doesn't take into account any of the races in 2024. So it's everything up till 2023 Abu Dhabi Grand Prix. Now finally, let's get into the ratings. We'll start off by looking at the highest ELO ratings ever achieved by a constructor. In first place, and it really shouldn't come as a surprise to anyone, it's Mercedes. They hit a peak ELO rating of 1,676 during the French Grand Prix in 2019. The rest of the top 10 look something like this. Now there's a lot we could talk about over here, but I wanna leave that for a different video. Over here, I really wanna focus on the driver ratings because that's what we're all here for. So moving on to the highest ELO rating ever achieved by any driver. And in first place, with a rating of 1,307, we have two-time world champion, Jim Clark. What I love most about this is that he actually hit this rating in 1964 during the Belgian Grand Prix, one year before he won the world championship the second time. The rest of the top 10 look something like this. Based on these results, I think there's one clear question on everyone's mind, which is, where is Ayrton Senna? Ayrton Senna is actually ranked 13th on this list. Now, this might come as a shock because he is considered the greatest racing driver of all time. We have to understand that the ELO rating system, especially when showing the peak rating, can only really show how dominant a driver was. In the case of Senna, he was in really close rivalry with other drivers, so he couldn't really get a peak rating that was extremely high. If we look at one of his close rivals, Alain Prost, he actually had the exact same rating as him, and in the same year, in fact, and he's ranked 12th on this list. So this is definitely one of the limitations of the ELO rating system. It can only really measure how dominant a driver was. In order to get past this though, we can do something. We can look at a driver's average ELO rating throughout their lifetime. This helps highlight the consistency in a driver's performance. As we can see here, the ratings actually change a little bit. Ayrton Senna and Alan Prost both jump up significantly over here, showing that they were very consistent drivers. It's just they didn't dominate one another as much as some other drivers did during their peak. Looking at these ratings, you're probably thinking, these are all drivers who had amazing cars. How have I taken into account the cars that they're driving? And to be fair, I thought the exact same thing. But I changed my mind when I looked at the constructor ratings and the driver ratings as of 2023. If we first look at the constructor ratings at the end of 2023, it shouldn't be so surprising that Red Bull is way ahead of the rest of the grid. Red Bull is followed by Ferrari, Mercedes and McLaren, who have a pretty similar rating. To see if the impact of the car was accurately taken into account, let's compare the constructor ratings with the driver ratings at the end of 2023. At the top, we obviously have Max Verstappen. He won pretty much every single race, so it shouldn't be surprising even if he's in the best car. Now what we're looking for here are outliers that don't really fit in with the rating of their cars. For example, Alex Albon had the sixth highest rating on the grid, in contrast to Williams, which was actually rated the third worst car on the grid. Another surprising example here that shows that the car was actually taken into account is Sergio Perez. He's rated extremely low for being in the best car, and especially considering that he came second in the driver's championship. As bad as I feel for saying this, this really does make sense because his performance compared to his teammate was really bad. And the difference in the points between him and the drivers that follow him simply didn't reflect how dominant the Red Bull car was that season.
so to me it makes perfect sense that he would be rated so low now there is one more comparison we can make that i think pretty much everyone will agree with if we look at the aston martin drivers we can see that fernando alonso was rated fourth highest on the grid right behind lando norris and lewis hamilton his teammate lance stroll was also rated fourth from the bottom and for this i really don't think i have to say anything i'm pretty sure most people would agree with me so i think it's just best we leave it at that so looking at the ratings at the end of 2023 statistically speaking i think the results are pretty accurate and they represent the driver skills pretty well but when it comes to the argument for the title of the greatest i think it's pretty clear that my elo engine does favor jim clark what i'm interested to see though is if max verstappen can actually catch up to this rating and be number 1 he's only 25 points behind jim clark There's a really good chance that he could be number 1 on the highest ELO rating ever achieved. One interesting thing I want to show you guys though is Max's rating throughout 2023. If we look at this graph, there's two points where Max's rating actually drops down throughout 2023. The first drop is during the second race where he actually qualified 15th and came second. The second drop was in Singapore where he actually came 5th and qualified 11th. Max and Red Bull have a rating that is so far ahead of the rest of the grid that even if he comes 5th his rating drops down even when he qualifies 15th and comes 2nd his rating drops down so i'm just curious to see how much the dnf in australia would have affected his rating and if he can actually make that up again by the end of the season let me know what you guys think do you think max can actually beat the record and reach 1307 Also let me know what you guys think of the ratings in general. Do you agree with them? Did your favorite driver make the list? Let me know down below in the comments. I'm also going to update the database and then I'll keep adding new results at every race weekend. So if you guys like this video and you want to keep track of the ratings throughout the season, make sure to keep an eye out on my channel. I'll be updating the ratings at every Grand Prix weekend. Finally, I want to give a big thanks to Mr. V who made the original Elo rating engine. and a huge thanks to Vopani for uploading this amazing database on Kaggle without which none of this would be possible